Hello and welcome to another Gut Reaction review of Shogun Episode 7, A Stick of Time. I'll be joined shortly by my usual guests. Uh, I'll be off camera for the most part this evening, but you all know how gorgeous I look already, so uh, it's not like you need to see me. Uh, fortunately, three of my sexy guests will be on camera, so you can focus on their good looks instead. Uh, we'll be doing our usual breakdown of the show and letting you know our thoughts. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you can. If you can share the stream, do a post about it, we would appreciate it. Growing channel and all that kind of thing, so your support is uh, most welcome. Do let us know what you think of the show. Put comments uh, in the chat, and if you have any questions uh, for any of my panellists, I'll do my best to get round to them. First of all, uh, the man who never drinks when he's working, it's uh, Blue Collar Loser. Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> Only on my channel. Yeah, that's is, true. Not really, not really the main job. <laughs> How you doing? Good. I'm trying to make more stills. It's like I um I love Hulu and these services, but I get open when the sites keep crashing on me. Like it's, I have to start making stills Tuesday mornings to make it easier. It's uh, the internet, you know. Well, we don't need too many for tonight, but yeah, uh, yeah it was uh well we get into it, but it was a very very interesting episode as uh oh, yeah. john travolta's with us again uh very packed episode yes indeed yeah. lots going on but uh you know again not like the band of brothers uh packed episode sheer wall of dragons it was great and it had lady fuji in it so that's a win for me yes well it was quite an intimate scene with her we'll, we'll get on to that uh the man who's uh transmitter comes from the north pole hence the interference darth plato is in the house how are you doing? Thank you for having me on. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, Outpost 31, you must be, surely. <laughs> and uh, we also have the man guarding the wall for us up north. Hello, my southern friends and my American friends. Uh, I thought I might have caught you napping again for a minute there, but glad to see you were awake. Just barely, just barely. Yeah, I, I, like had, <laughs> I had the roughest nights sleep yesterday because i think yeah there's so something going wrong because i was feeling a bit crappy last night as well well it was like i went to bed at five and then i got um about half seven because you sleep in increments of four hours don't you and about half seven i got woken up by the neighbors drilling because they're having an extension built but i've got it all worked out i've got my sofa bed in the office so i staggered into the the office crashed on that but then my neighbors above me in the flat above me, started doing their morning workout with their music on. So I was like, oh, fuck. I changed rooms three times. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, my, my sleep is not great. And I got, like, an upset tummy today. So, uh, yes. But anyway, enough about that. Last but by no means least, coming in on that fantastic story, is the man who uh, writes books about the Wild West. It's uh, Leroy Peters. Good to have you back. Yes. What does the A stand for? Anthony. <clears throat> That's okay. my middle name, Anthony. We've got uh, Darth Plato, uh, uh, sorry, Dan Candy in the chat. Uh, we've got Darth Plato on the stream. If I'd never read a book, I'd been enjoying the show a lot more, I think. Oh, you mean the book, yeah. And uh, Keithy, of course, uh, who got chucked off his first, uh, he got banned from his first YouTube channel last night. Well done, Keith. I get told that all the time. <laughs> That's a, that's a badge of honor right there. Okay, well, let's get into this uh, episode without any further delay. I've done uh, my usual detailed uh, breakdown. I may occasionally uh, pause for, for a comment on a certain section uh, panel. If I do, just, just respond to that section. Don't go off on a random tangent. There'll be time for random tangents later. Mm -hmm. so, All right. Shogun, part seven, sticking... The stick in the sky? No, the stick, stick of, of time, time. I think it's called. Oh, stick I, of time. I wrote that down wrong. A stick of time. Yeah, which is a, a reference to something important that we'll get onto. I don't know why I wrote that down wrong. Right. Okay. All right. So we pan down from a banner, um, a f well, flag, if you like, uh, across the remnants of a desolate battlefield. Forty-six years earlier, we're told. Forty-six years ago and um a lord called maguchi i think his his name is or Ms. Gucci, uh had to fight uh was forced to fight in an unwinnable war 
and uh, he's been beaten by the young Toronaga, who's barely a teenager, I think. He was uh, 12. 12, that's what I thought, yeah. Um, and uh, he, he's, he's beat him in battle. It's, it's Toronaga's first battle. So as is the custom, uh, Ms. Gucci has to um, commit serpaku or hurry curry, as we call it in the UK. And um, he, he chooses the young Toronaga as his second, which means he will be the person to actually behead him uh, once the first act of Serpaku is uh, committed. Uh, we don't see it all. Thank God. <laughs> we, we, we cut to titles uh, before. Now, if any of you have ever seen the low-budget fantasy film Sword and the Sorcerer, right near the beginning of the movie... There is a pan across a battlefield with a lot of dead bodies and smoke and all the rest of it. And when you don't want to spend a big budget on a battle in a movie or a show, you show the aftermath of the battle, which is a lot cheaper, but quite atmospheric. And that's what they did here with a lot of similar techniques. So we're back in the present. There's a meeting in the woods um, uh, between some of Toronaga's commanders um, and... Uh, they're basically due to meet his <laughs> self-described as his media mediocre brother, uh, Saki Saiki. I think it's Saiki. Saiki, yeah. Uh, Darth, can you confirm in the book is this his full brother or is he like a half brother or is there any detail there that I've missed? I think I think he was a half brother, young, definitely younger. In the book, he was called Lord Zataki. Lord oh, Zataki. Okay, thank you. Um, Basically, we learn that this alliance, because he's got a few, he's got an army of his own, is, is crucial uh, if they're going to carry out their, their crimson uh, operation, their attack on Osaka Castle. And if he says no, somebody says, uh, we'll all be dead before our swords are wet. I quite like that line. Um, there's a conference in the woods where the brothers are... Uh, reacquainted it's a little bit tense initially but then they they appear to be on good terms Anjin is introduced to him um and uh there's a little bit of uh you know the usual kind of eyes back and forth between the various characters um then we cut to the next scene um lady kiku uh we're told um by um uh oh, what's her name mako mako Mariko. Mariko, thank you. Is being hired. Told you I didn't have a lot of sleep. Is being hired um, for the brother uh, for a week uh, at an extremely high fee, which includes a stick of time, which um, at first we probably wouldn't have known what that meant, but it means basically you're being granted an audience with Toronaga. So a stick of time or an audience with someone of that high standing is a form of currency, which is kind of cool, and that refers to the title of the episode, uh, and I like that. Um, same scene a little bit further on, Anjin and Toronaga have a meeting. Uh, Mariko uh, says he's got to be on his best behaviour. Uh, Anjin is kind of frustrated about his role in Crimson Sky. He doesn't really understand what his role is to be. He's still scheming. He's still sort of trying to get out of it, leave the Japans, um, but Toronaga just doesn't want to talk about it. He's got more important things quite rightly on his mind. Um, then we have the, uh, the young boy who's in, in love with Lady Kiku, the, uh, the top Omi. Con con yeah, consort. Yeah. Omi. Thank you. I called him man boy. Cause that's kind of what he's like. Um, yeah. he visits Lady Jin. Uh, he wants a little meeting with Kiku, but, Lady Jin says, unfortunately, she's not available and uh, you should have somebody else more suitable to your standing. And he's quite put out by this because, of course, he loves uh, Kiku. It's a short scene, but it's important. Um, I think now the grandfather of um, Jintaro is his grandfather. He brings well, back. It, that's correct, isn't it? Um, he's Fuji's grandfather and Buntaro's father. But right, okay. Let me just make a note of that. I thought he was um Fuji's grandfather. No, he is Fuji's grandfather. Oh right. Okay. He's also Bentaro's father. And, and and his father. Okay, right. Let me, let me 
correct. Bontaro's Fuji's uncle. Well, I have watched this twice as well. Yeah, do correct me if I get anything wrong. So uh, the grandfather character is one of my favorite characters. I really like him. Uh, he comes back and he brings the remains of the children and the uh, the husband um, back to Fuji, which is, you know, pretty sort of horrible to get this white box. It looks like a cake. Um, she basically states that she wants to do her duty and then really kind of leave this world. So um, her and um, uh, Mareko have a very similar uh, goal in that that sense. The generals gather, and um, there's a, a basically a sort of a dinner with lots of drinking. Um, uh, there's a there's a conversation prior to that where the where the son of Toronaga says, "I hear your first kill on the battlefield is better than your first woman." Uh, to which one of the others replies, "Depends on the woman," which I thought was a brilliant piece of writing. That was fantastic. So then they had they have the dinner with the uh, the half brother. And there's a lot of banter, and. Um, the son says, uncle, you honor me with these stories of the past. And uncle starts to tell the story of uh, what we saw at the beginning, which is um, the aftermath of the battle with young Toronaga. And we learned that it took Toronaga about nine attempts to actually chop off this guy's head. It was a proper mess. Um, that's the true version of what happened. He talks about his experience with Kiku describes it as, uh, excuse my language, trying to fuck a sunset, which is uh, a priceless line that um, I just, I can't wait to say that to somebody. Uh, I can't <laughs> think of the circumstances I might have to say that to someone, but I, I feel mm. I must. Um, Uncle, uh, yes, yeah, so Uncle tells another story of um, the time he was given away as a hostage, Toronaga, and he shit his pants um, and so on, and, you know, stories and legends and all this kind of thing. Yeah. But then the, the, the masquerade is kind of dropped. Um, and uh, we learn that uh, the uncle um, has basically um, become the fifth regent and um, is there officially to ask for Toronaga's surrender and to escort him back to Osaka. So the whole evening descends in a horrible mood. Uh, on these sort of outposts around the army, we hear all his men turning up and blocking off all the exits. So they're, they're, it's implied that they're basically tra trapped, although I'm sure they could fight their way out. Um, Anjin tells Mariko maybe they should escape on his boat, a kind of fanciful plan that almost certainly will fail. Uh, but he's kind of desperate to, he's thinking, well, we're all going to die. You know, this is, this is no good. Um, Ishido sends his reply from the previous envoy, uh, which is basically their head in a box. So there's another little scene that we see. Uh, Anjin goes to the shores of the village to go and see his own ship, and he sees another mighty ship arriving. Um, we're informed that this is Shido's ship, but I don't think he's actually on it because um, he doesn't come off the ship or anything, so I'm not sure if that's correct. Um, so then we have another conference scene, and the generals and Toronaga's son want to know what he's decided because he has to give his answer by the following sunset. In the interim, Lady Jin comes to claim her stick of time. Uh, with her meeting with Toronaga, and this is my favourite scene in the episode, again, it's just such a well-played scene, uh, she informs him that she's aware that he plans to build a new city in Edo, and she wants Willow World um, to be part of a guild of courtesans, which, of course, she will lead, and to have its own district, so full of the best tea houses in, in the country. Um, Torin Argus is kind of not really up for discussing this. He's, he sees it as quite trivial, but, um, and he, he talks about fate. And then she says to him, fate is like a sword, useful only to those who can wield it. Oh, such a good line. I don't know if that's a line straight from the book, but it's great. So Lady Jin, you can see in this scene, she knows she's, she's got him completely sus because she knows from her experience of working in brothels all her life exactly how to read men, even as clever as Torinaga. She sees his plans within plans. You can see it in that scene if you, if you watch. We then go to the hot springs 
scene, bit of a brief male nudity, very, very exciting for Blue. Um, the son and the cousin talk. He My suspects his father is planning something, but isn't sure. The uncle shows up. <laughs> um, Anjin, meanwhile, is uh, sword fighting training. Uh, Buntaro watches, comes in with the sword, and there's a discussion that Anjin would have died there and then if the uh, other guy hadn't been there. We cut to Fuji training. Um, son and uh, Toronaga's son apologizes to her for not being the one to stand up to Bushido's lies because then it would have been him instead of her husband uh, who would have been executed, and, and he kind of regrets that. Um, when Toro comes to see Toronaga, begs to kill Anjin before they all die the following day, kind of uh, an important scene. Uh, Toronaga asks if he is accusing his wife of an affair. Um, and then Bentaro kind of loses his composure and says no uh, and dismisses himself. So Toronaga, meanwhile, demands to know where Mariko stands. Uh, she says she's remained loyal to him and begs for her life to be taken. Uh, Kugsi dismisses that idea. That evening, Toronaga reveals, uh, this is where we find out, reveals it took nine strokes for him to behead that lord as a child. So we, we find that out when he talks about it with the uh, older commander. So the brother arrives for his answer. Toronaga officially surrenders um, and says he'll go with them the following day. Um, Anjin, um, instead of sitting there and being respectful and not saying anything, uh, calls, you know, calls out Toronaga in front of all of his commanders. Quite a tense scene. Says crimson horse shit. And goes storming off. I'm amazed he didn't get killed on the spot. Then we cut to Kiku getting a severe pounding. Um, I suspect Kiku boom, boom. in this scene. I think she was. I think she was going to murder him. I think she was going to murder the brother because she says there's a whole conversation about let's take things to another level. Would you like me to show you? And she disappears out the room to get something. I think she was going to probably tie him up and then murder him. But unfortunately, they're interrupted by Toronaga's son, who attempts to take him out himself, but unfortunately dies in the process. Spoiler alert. Probably I should have said that the other way around. Um, and we cut to titles. So, uh, wow. Yeah, not quite as many scenes as the last one, but not far off. Um, lots going on. Uh, major plot points. Again, it's funny, it feels like a show that's packed with action without lots of actual action. Uh, so, Darth, um, you go first, because I'd like to know how close is this episode following the book, and uh, what, did, what did you like? What was your favourite scene? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, this is no longer an adaptation. This is a reimagining of the Shogun book. It's the entire part of part six, part seven, part eight of the book is uh, very dense, very complex. If you were to put this onto the screen, we would probably be doubling the length of the series, which I wouldn't object to, but that's just the way it is. So what they've done is they've completely truncated that last third quarter of the book. And they've done it in a reimagining way so that what we're seeing in this episode hardly happens at all the only thing you really see is the negotiation between the the uh Bentura wanting to take blackthorn's head the uh the meeting with toronaga and yoko again that, that, that does happen. um the uh the, the coming of the brother they changed his name for some reason but whatever uh, that's pretty much all that's there. This, the part about him being, about Toronaga being a young Alexander the Great, I'm not sure what they're talking about there. Alexander didn't have his first battle until he was 16. So, um, that's my quick answer to that. As far as my favorite scene goes, I agree with you. I think the best scene is probably the uh, sit-down between Toronaga and Gin. Yeah, I really love that that scene. It says so much about both of them but her especially and it's it's interesting how she's a very very important woman probably has more knowledge than all of them put together um yeah so uh yeah, she's a very underrated character in the book another one was uh yabu's wife but we only see her in episode four you probably will see her again so uh, what you're saying is the meat of this episode isn't even in the book correct 
almost everything in this episode is not in the book. It's completely reimagined. What about the sun being killed? Because that's a pretty significant event. The sun completely disappears from the narrative. He, his fate is not is mentioned at all. Yeah, because I don't remember him getting killed in the Richard Chamberlain one. Yeah. I don't okay. think he was in. I don't remember seeing him in the Richard Chamberlain one. Yeah, I, yeah, I can't remember right now. Um, but uh, there were a lot of characters in the Richard Chamberlain one. Um, well, uh, Northern, yeah. we'll come on to you because you're you, you're actually watching the 1981 for the first time at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, I've just finished episode three, and I think um, he was talking about Taranaga was put, talking about putting the guy's kids to death, but then uh, it turns out it was all the rules because he had to test some guy's loyalty. Yeah, I remember but, that um, too. Yeah, if I'm, if I'm remembering it correctly. I've only just watched it now, not too long ago. So, Okay, Nick, so I'll start that description from the beginning. Here we go. <laughs> uh, so what, how did you find the episode, Northern? Uh, it's pretty good. It's uh, what this the episode for the new one. It's, um, yeah. It is a little bit more slower. And to be honest, I think Blackthorn t- kind of takes a bit of a back seat here to everyone else. And, yeah, uh, but I don't mind that because he's not the most interesting of the characters. I find the Japanese characters much more interesting to watch. I agree. He is on this show, but on the, on the original, I do think Blackthorn is a little bit more interesting. It's, um, But then again, the original show is mostly from his point of view. So yeah. any of the diplomatic sides we see between the Japanese characters is, is uh, totally off screen and actually narrated or told by a character through exposition, which kind of makes this show a bit better because we are seeing characters um all this exposition actually shown visually we see Taranaga be a bit more diplomatic how are you finding the lack of subtitles on the original uh, a little bit refreshing <laughs> uh, do you do you know they they said that that was deliberate so that you got the story from Richard Chamberlain's point of view but I think one yeah of the- I think one of the producers down the road said, yeah, we said that, but actually it was because it was the first major Western show with 60% subtitles required and it was too expensive. <laughs> so yeah, they, I think, they, so I they think, just I think said... have a little problem with uh, Black Fawn a little bit in this episode because it looks looks like he hasn't really adapted that much, like he hasn't learned saw play like he probably should have done. It would have been smarter if he'd have learned a bit of saw play yeah. earlier on. Especially if he's yeah, going to be too well. I've, I've found his lack of warrior skills. That took me by surprise. I didn't expect him to be an expert swordsman, but I thought he he, he came across a bit wimpy with, with that. Yeah. One thing, I've to change his character a little bit from just a sailor who's just, only just been in command for a short while. Well, because well, Chamberlain actually seemed like someone who, 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 who is in command. Like he's always in control of the situation, even when he's not in control. Yeah. Yeah, fair, fair point. Well, Blackthorn would have been experienced with a cutlass, but that's about it. Yeah, yeah but that's that's still a sword. So, you know, I mean, I know they're very different, but um, he just sort of seemed extremely uncomfortable with a weapon. No, I, honestly, yeah. I didn't I didn't like this scene. This is my least favorite scene of the, of the yeah. episode because it looks like they're trying to borrow from The Last Samurai, that scene with Tom Cruise in the ring. Yeah, and I also didn't sort of buy Blackthorn being quite as passive as he was. In this scene, um, the Richard Chamberlain uh, version of him would not have been as passive as this. I did love uh, the set design in the background. Those ships look like, I mean, did they actually build those ships? Is that CGI? I can't tell. <laughs> Pretty sure that's CG. Yeah, just that's And, so and none, none of this should even be taking place in Andrew. They're supposed to be up by Yedo and up by another location. So the the, the fact that they're even staying in this location is, is kind of puzzling to me. Blue, what were your thoughts on the episode? Um... Yeah, first his brother wasn't sure what to expect, and I do like he first meets him. Like, is he gonna like be pissed off at him, angry, and oh, he calls me, you know, a, a piss, piss eating drunk or something. And uh, yeah, it's the whole thing with like you know legends, legends versus what happened. He's like, yeah, would you prefer the story to be your father took a guy's head off in one swing? It wasn't one swing; it was about nine. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like versus you know, it's it's amazing how stories and legends they get um everything gets uh, embellished. And even with uh, her and her husband, it, uh, I like the scene. What you know, I want your permission before we die. Take off the barbarian's head. Why? Well, I, I like the way he looks at my wife, and he goes, "Okay," but that means you're also accusing your wife as well. So if you want to kill 
um, you know, Black Thorn, you have to kill her too. And he's like, no, I'm sorry. And yeah, he, which he would, you're right, because that's yeah. a cultural thing. I think. And, and even with uh, America, I like this scene with her and um, right there, she's like, you know, free, free me of this cursed life. You know, I'm tired of like, I'm tired of living every damn in agony and just, and he smacks it out of her hand. He's just frustrated. You know, this is how she, like, he cares about her. Plus he needs her and she's a, she wants to die so bad. It's like, it's really kind of messed up. Yeah. Uh, favorite scene, Blue? Damn. Um, I don't, I think, I think the son, uh, the, the way the son died because like he said, the uncle says right there is like, yeah, you want to, um, time to become a man. And it's like the, the simplistic part where he's going to kill his uncle. He slips on a rock. Yeah, and, I know. And, and it may be, sounds, it, may be cool. it may be stupid, but it's almost like sometimes that happens. <laughs> like that's, um, with the ending for uh the third Emily Shyamalan film um split with uh with Bruce Willis it's the fact that he died in a puddle some people are mad like oh my god they would kill this guy in a puddle yeah a two-foot puddle can kill a person and sometimes when people die it's not as glorious or as, as magnificent and you think it could just be slipping on a rock and cracking your head <laughs> and, like the way he died I'm like didn't see that yeah, coming yeah I had to watch that a couple I had to rewind that and think like did he slip and then get stabbed or I kind of yeah back and forth and, and then that. he says too is like that's the scene is like where's the beauty in this you know because yeah. like you're a young kid you think glory is battle so glorious but his father's saying as well his dad's like you know why is it those who've never been in battle are so glorious to enter battle yeah you know, that's like, a great line Naga, just he's an older wise guy where you can tell he's really tr yeah why is it why is it that only those who never fought in a battle are so eager to join one and that that's the part of wisdom in getting older uh leroy uh how did you like this episode? Well, I had to see it twice to give it a fair rating. Yeah. And I skipped don't write, it. Don't, don't rate it yet. We'll do that. At the okay. End. Um, it wasn't a bad episode, but the ending with Tornaga's son really pissed me off. Um, because I was really hoping that he would kill his, his treacherous uncle. Um, my favorite scene, in fact, this whole I just want to say this whole episode reminds me of an episode on Game of Thrones when Jon Snow's stepmother and his half brother or his cousin were betrayed by the Ramses. I think. Are you talking about the wedding, or uh, oh, you're talking about when the Ramses come in and take Winterfell? Or I, I think so. It's when it's when um. His cousin's wife, pregnant wife, is stabbed in her stomach. And then her mom. Oh, that's the red. Was, that's the red wedding. That's yeah, the red. that's what this episode reminds me of. And just for the record, I am not a fan of Game of Thrones. I, even though I binge watch all eight seasons, well, I, that's hated the, I mean, that's I hated it. it. That's what it's good. I hated it because too many good guys were getting slaughtered, and that's how I kind of felt about this episode. My favorite scene, and I'm Darth Plato, Lance. Sorry, my favorite scene. Is when Anjan and Yabashuki are practicing sword fighting because ah. I'm starting to respect Anjan a little bit more because he doesn't hesitate. He lets Yabashuki try to teach him, and the fact that he hasn't started learning more Japanese than he's already learned kind of surprised me. But he's definitely, he like I said, he he he's gaining my respect a little bit more, especially after. Tornaga surrendered, and the first yeah. thing he said, he called out Yabashuki's name and um, Tornaga's son's name. And he, when he says their names, he says it out of respect because they're the ones who still want to fight, who do not want to surrender. And that's when he says in Japanese that you're all dead because he kind of lost respect for Tornaga, which yeah. I can't understand. So, but the, the ending. I was I did not see that coming. I was I was rooting for Tornaga's son. I was hoping he'd kill his treacherous uncle. Then he slips on a rock, cracks his skull. Um well, but don't you like, think it's more dramatic that he doesn't do that and the son dies in terms of dramatic tension for the for the show? Rather I don't know, man. You know me. I like it when I hate it when good guys lose, man. That's just yeah, but, this but, is my bias. If the good guys win all the time, you've got no drama, you've got no tension, therefore you lose stakes. Therefore, it's a bit like um, the film with uh, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Stallone, the, the 
what's it, the indispensables or whatever. Yeah, expendables. Expendables. Yeah, you, you know they're all signed up for the next sequel. Therefore, yeah. you know none of them are going to die. Therefore, the yeah. action, no matter how much action there is in those films, becomes redundant. Because no, thought, no, I, no one's going to get seen the last. I haven't seen the last Expendables, but I thought the first two no, were, don't. were out of <laughs> out of sight. So, but um, one one thing I was one thing I want to talk about that really bothered me. And again, I understand this is a culture, a different culture, and and we're talking about during the 1600s. But I'm losing respect for Lady Mariko because of her suicidal tendencies, and and I, I kind of respect Tornaga even more the fact that. He's getting frustrated with her because she wants to die. I mean, there's always a reason to live. I'm speaking as someone who's lost friends to suicide. And I'm also speaking from my own experience. I mean, if to want whether it's culture or not to want to commit suicide, you got to be a very weak-minded person. And I think yeah, she's I, dis- off I disagree. That. I think she has to be quite strong to want to go through that you've got to understand that she's been in a loveless marriage all her life and the only thing that's keeping her going is serving Toranaga so as far as she's concerned once that mission is completed she's done yeah it's um, definitely a difference of culture like they said before this entire show the uh the Japanese culture the to these guys life and death is basically the same thing like like to them, yeah. to them death is just like another another like guess veil or like another step in your journey but they don't see it as yeah, the way the, their whole view is a lot different than how we you know, we view it. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand. That. I'm still trying. I'm still trying to understand it, but it's very, like I said, it's very hard for me to res- to try to respect that because of my own experience. And like I said, I've lost friends to suicide, and it, it's yeah, very no, I mean, listen, dude, so have I. In fact, I had the displeasure of finding somebody who hung himself in some woods, and I had to go to his inquest and i didn't even yeah. know him you know and meet all his family which was trust me was a you know not a fun experience but I, I don't equate that to this environment this is a tv show set in another culture and i don't want to see it reflect my real life or the people that i know or that are around me i appreciate that's a sensitive and difficult issue but i do want to see it presented as the way it should be accurately reflected in the Japanese culture of this time and how people would feel and do and act. So I get, I get where you're coming from Leroy, but I think it's a bit misguided because you, you don't want to see the tropes of the environment you live in now in this show. Otherwise we're going to be dumbing down everything all the time. And it, you'll just lose any sense of drama. Do you follow me? Yeah, I follow you. I'm, I, and, and let me tell you something. The show, even the even the worst episodes of the show, which I thought episode five was, I still can't give it anything less than an eight point eight on 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 an, if I was to rate an episode. So the show's still good. And told you to wait to give you a rating. <laughs> oh, I, I haven't rated this episode just yet. Okay, good. But um, yeah, that that scene with Moriko's it's kind of hard to. To watch her and respect her, but I also respect the Tornaga, the fact he continues to deny her request because he's getting frustrated. So, um, but also, like I said, I just started respecting Angela a little bit more because with the with the with the practicing with Yabashuki, and even when Bantaro tried to kill him, he showed no fear. Yeah, he said, "Get on with it." And when Tornaga surrendered. He called out Yabashuki's name and Toronaga's son's name. I can't. I have a hard, hard time pronouncing Toronaga's son's name. Naga's oh, whatever it's called. Right. But he, when he said their names, he said it with respect. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. I get you. Yeah. I uh, just want to give a shout out to uh, Navasari. Hey, uh, just finished binging all your Masters of the Air, American History, American History, X, American History X. Thanks, man. That's a, you've just digested a whole load of content there. Uh, <laughs> this last week, last recommendation from drinker a week or so ago this is my first time catching the live stream uh well good to have you on buddy we do a regular chat every tuesday night at 10 that would be five o'clock east coast uh and occasionally do streams on uh saturdays uh plus my random gaming ones which will just pop up all over the place uh glad you're liking the content we are going to be doing a breakdown of band of brothers from start to finish with my friend who worked on the show uh, and we're going to be 
I'm going to come at it from a different angle because a lot of people have done Banner Brothers podcasts, including with some of the actors on board. We're going to talk about it from the production standpoint, how it was shot, uh, what they needed to do. And we're also going to do a um, special episode on the on the script that was dropped, on the episode that was wow. never, never shot. So uh, that's all to come later this uh, year, just trying to lock down the dates. Uh, but we are welcome. So, um, so Nick, I mean, is chucking out the same question I asked Darth earlier. How much is this deviating from the book or the 1980 series? It's already very different from the 1980 series. Um, some bits are the same, but uh, a lot of it's very different. I'm loving this better than the 1980 series. And I only saw the 1980 series once. Yeah, um, overall, I'm liking it better. I do like, I've got a soft spot for the 80 series. There are some things about it that are really, really good, um, especially the music. And uh, But the production design in this is like 10 times better. Just it looks looks and feels a lot more real. Uh, yeah, apparently this is more historically accurate from what I'm hearing. Right. Yeah, because the book was more of a romanticised version of a uh, few. Yeah. yeah, James Clavell's books always have a massive romantic narrative between two dysfunctional characters at their core. <clears throat> um, and I think history will generally sort of come second to those priorities. But it um, be interesting to see if they make Whirlwind, which was another big bestseller of his. Uh, uh, Blue, you wanted to say something? Oh no! I was just like I I I shared the part on um, the screen if you want to show where uh, he dies, his son dies. I got that little. Yeah, bit. let's uh, let's have a quick look at that. Yeah, it's only a quick second, but yeah, I did not see that part coming at all. When like when That's when rare. his son came in, I was about to kill. Him. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, he just sort of. I mean, that's a big trip as well. Yeah, that's um, what. Like, but I think he trips because the guy goes like. to swipe at him, right? <laughs> No, well, he, just, he actually slipped on the rock and landed right. on his cracked right. skull. I'll watch this part right here. Let's just see it again. All right. Yeah, because he's, he's he's got him like banged to rights there. Yeah. Oh, he slipped yeah. on. He not only slipped on the rock. He slipped on the guy's skirt. Yeah. Oh, on his on his on his outfit. He's, uh, shower there, yeah. Even more embarrassing. Let's watch this. I'm sorry, my curse is off. Watch Ray. Honestly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, the guy moved. That's a hoover. Well, the guy <laughs> moved back, so he moved the material as he stepped on it. You see, I yeah. didn't pick up on that at all. Before. Yeah, that I thought that ruined the entire episode, man. Because, <laughs> like I said, I was rooting for his son. Yeah, take out the bad guy. Take out your treacherous uncle. I think it fits him more around. because uh, he went in all impulsive, without a bloody plan, and he uh, paid for it. That's uh, that too suitable for his character. Well, also, yeah, yeah, he, he he constantly reacts without thinking, doesn't he? That's, yeah, he doesn't, yeah. He doesn't think his actions through. That's it's what happened there. before with the whole um talk between his him and his father with the Falcon. He's like, you uh, you keep making mistakes and you're too impulsive, and he's trying to teach his son stop, and got yeah. him killed. Uh, Dan Candy um says, I prefer the original series. It was way more faithful to the source material. Uh, believe it or not, Blackthorn is the main character and not a guest star. I, I've seen it, um, Dan. I've I own it and I watched it all recently in the lead up to the. Dan movie. Candy doesn't understand the whole purpose of the of the remake. I'm sorry, Dan. But uh, but I I mean, Dan, I agree with you in the sense that that's what Clavel envisaged. It, you see the whole culture through Blackthorn's eyes. You only learn stuff when he learns it, which is why they didn't have. Well, so they say they didn't have subtitles in the original, but. Mm. If we just got that exactly the same again, I think it would be boring. I like the fact that we're we're getting more of the Japanese context of it. Um, same to, here. To date, I agree with Dan. Aaron Agar is a bit better in this, uh, I will admit. And I like the original actor who plays him because, uh, come on, it's the guy from New Jimbo. What more it, It's Rich, Richard Chamberlain. Yeah. yeah. Who no, also did that amazing King that. Solomon's Minds film, of course. You no, know, I just uh, I just saw something. You know who? Tornaga and his son kind of remind me of uh, a scene in Tombstone when Wyatt Earp is warning his younger brother Morgan to not become a lawman. Oh, uh, yeah. That's um, what it kind of reminds me of. Because when Tornaga said, why is it those who are so in a hurry to battle, go into battle have never even been in one? And if you remember a scene in Tombstone, Wyatt Earp is experienced when it comes as a lawman. He actually killed a guy. His brother Morgan had not. 
Uh, Darth, you 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 said you agree with Dan Candy that you uh, prefer the original take. To date, I do. Oh, so far, yeah. Reserving the right to change that view when we get to the end of the of the of the series. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, before we uh, give it our uh, score out of ten, um, bearing in mind some people have read the book and some haven't. Uh, Northern, what's your predictions for the next episode? What do you think is going to happen? Do you think he's going to surrender and go to Osaka? I don't. No, I, I agree. I don't think he will either. I mean, come on, to see Taranaga actually surrender and that be the end of the series. Be so ha- ha- well, I, I mean, that's not what's going to happen. So how's he going to get out of it, what do you think? I don't know. I don't want to know because uh, I, I, like, I, I like to be surprised. Okay. Uh, Blue? Um, let's see, I to me it's a nine out of ten because mainly because I didn't see the ending coming. That's why I said it because I expected no, I don't some... give you rating yet. I oh, said sorry. what are your predictions for next week? How do you um, think he's gonna get out no, of it? hundred percent Tornaga, it's like um I think he's well definitely more pissed off now that his son's dead. And it's uh with Ange and everybody, and one thing people who read the book like Lord Toxic and I know Plato has a lot that the whole uh saying for Tornaga is that you know he's playing checkers while you're all, or he's playing chess while you're all playing checkers. I don't see this at all. Like um, this is accidental. That I see this. His brother. I'm not sure where his brother. If he's still playing a front and he's actually going to betray his own brother because he does say to his son, he's like, even though we have problems, we're still family. And I wonder if like, yeah, Toronaga, he's up to something. There's no way in hell he's just, just going to walk in and just die. It's not going to happen. Mm. I think it. I think it adds a lot of drama. The, the... The, the son getting killed, and I, I do think yeah. that Kiku was going to kill him. I think that you know, don't forget that Toronaga paid for Kiku to be with him for a week, get comfortable with him, and um, yeah. I think Kiku, when she said, "I'm going to take it to the next level," I think she was going to kill him on orders of Toronaga. She was going to take him out um, discreetly, quietly. Then the son came in and fucked it all up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, so whether we'll find that out or not, I, I, I don't know. Uh, Darth, any uh, any thoughts about next episode? Um, yeah. I, th- I think that this whole thing, this whole, the current episode is a trap, sets up the trap that will be the next episode. I think that there's something going on here that that's not being uh, it's not obvious, and we should consider, consider it a bit of a screwball. One or two ways that this can play out. It could be that the uncle, the uh, Toronaga's brother, actually is not hostile. That he's actually in on what's going on. He's just pretending like he's being like this yeah. obnoxious jerk. That's one well, I, possibility. Yeah. Another poss- Another possibility is yes, he, he is being. He is really being like this because he thinks he's getting something out of it. But the death of of Naga at the end of this episode will give Toronaga as a, like a sort of leverage to get him to get his brother to come more in line with how his character was, Lord Zataki's character was in the book. Mm-hmm. And in the book, they made a deal. Zataki went to Toronaga to present the ultimatum. You're done, come to the council. And Toronaga made him a counter offer. And he accepted that counter offer in, in the book. What we what so what we'll see in the next episode is is sort of that come is sort of that come into being, or or the fact that this episode had episode eight, excuse me, episode seven that we just watched because it's been completely reimagined. It could be that we really can't predict what's going to happen in episode eight at all. So that's yeah. three scenarios that I'm throwing out at you right now. Uh, I'm, I'm going to chuck a fourth on top of that. I think he might have redeployed part of his army already somewhere else um and this might all be some kind of diversion delay but that's uh, that's my, but that's but that's the first scenario i gave you this is a trap oh okay well I, no. uh, you didn't get into the specifics of the redeployment of a hidden army so i thought i'd just add that on there yeah, yeah yes yes because because the um the horror you know i, I don't mind calling her a horror after all she did ban me from the willow world <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, well that uh, it's interesting that you brought that up. I've got an update uh, on that. Uh, <laughs> okay, go, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, where is it? Oh yeah, here we go. This just in. Uh, 
Darth to start his own tea house called Plato's <laughs> and uh, Northern Bastard to open a tea house in Hull called Slappers. But I think there's one that already there. Uh, <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> Blue Collar loses uh, debt to the uh, Willow world increases. Oh uh, he now owes 800, 850 Monmi to uh, Lady Jin. This is all part of uh, Shogun, the board game, which we've been playing uh, off camera. So, uh, yes, continue, uh, Darth. <coughs> so, she mentioned in the interview with Toranaga that your garrison seemed to be lighter than it normally would, even beyond what the earthquake had done to it. That's a that's that's a towel right there. That there's something. Yeah, there, I, I, there. I I picked up on that as well. Yeah, and she she just she knows something else is going on. Yeah, watch right now. Yeah, um, yeah. Should we have to play? Uh, I'll I'll say I'll say one more thing about the the, the scene with uh, Lord Bruntro asking for uh, Blackthorn's head. That does appear in the book. Except interestingly, it plays out differently in the book. In the book, Toronaga yeah. actually agrees to there it. You go. So long as the engine is no longer useful to him. Yeah. He doesn't reject that out of hand. Yeah. Yeah. And then. Uh... She, oh, she says, says that, that great line, fate is like a sword. Useful only to those who hmm. wield it. Yeah. Um, better pause it there. Yep. Yeah, I think. Um, and like you said, she does notice too. She's like, yeah, you know, um, it's pretty obvious, you know, his army could have been spotted from like a mile away. And it's like, it's just very, very unusual mistake for someone like you. I'll find yeah. that quote, but along those lines. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, Leroy, any predictions uh, for the next ep? I'm with blue collar loser. For myself from the preview, I don't see Tornaga surrendering, especially after his son is dead now. I think he's going to be really part of my language, pissed off, and he's <clears throat> he's going to fight. And also, again, to quote blue collar loser, Tornaga is, and in my opinion, is the ultimate good guy of the show. So if he if he loses, I'm going to be very unhappy because to me that that will uh, Mariko, Anjan, all the others, forget all of them. OK, if Toranaga loses and dies, I'm going to be very unhappy because to me that will ruin the entire series right there after all that. OK, well, we'll 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 see what uh, what happens. Um I don't know about him being the ultimate good guy. He's certainly the ultimate chess player. That's uh, that's uh, oh, it's cool. right there. And she says it doesn't make any sense. Any spy could tell him about the army coming his way. Why leave your weakened garrison so exposed? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That when she said, "Why would you make such a careless yeah, mistake?" Yeah. And I'm thinking he hasn't, and uh, you yeah. can see it in his face. Yeah. Um, He's smart. Yeah. I mean, yeah. even though she's a, you know. She's a lady of the night. She's smart. She's probably the only character that's as smart as him in the show, I would say. Oh, yeah, because she mentions her hardships and how she was nothing in, in the gutter yeah. and made her the you know the smartest, most most powerful woman in her position. And same thing with him. Yeah, she reminds me of uh, Asperia, if you know your uh, Greek classics. I don't. I'm Elaborate I'm further, I'm... Darth, those who don't. It's from the... Um... The Thucydides writing about the Peloponnesian War, with um, she was a a sort of figure like Kiku, like Gin, except she was associated with uh, Pericles. Best I can offer. Hey. Take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, probably not using the bathroom, but yeah. Overall, good, good episode, and uh, I do definitely like didn't it. just dash to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, you did that. I'm still hoping Anjan and Fuji will hook up because, I mean, she is his consort. So I think in the I think in the original 1980 version, I think they do at, at one point. Uh, I might be remembering that wrong, but um, no, I think well, they, they do, didn't they? 
No, I think he hooked up Mariko. There's some affection towards Fuji in the original, right after the uh, old man gets killed over the pheasant. Right. It does look like yeah. it a little bit. Yeah. He sh- he, that yeah. was in episode five. He sh- he shows some affection towards Fuji. So I'm hoping Fuji, after her term is up, she doesn't. I'm basically hoping he, as he shows more kindness towards her, something happens between them. Mm. Well, you know, one must pillow where one can. <laughs> uh, Nix predicts there's going to be a new review on the Outcast Creative. New prediction. Says- your prediction is probably going to become oh, yeah. true, I would think. Next is genius. Yeah. Um, I, I did I did like this um, episode overall. I thought it was was really good. It, it maybe didn't have the quite the same gravitas or power of some of the other episodes just because of the presentation of different characters and different scenes. But, yeah. I mean, like this scene, for example, the tension in this scene, was through the roof. Yeah. Um, I feel for any woman that's in a loveless marriage or anybody that's in a loveless marriage. Oh, indeed. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, but it, yeah, it, it still fantastic writing was never bored. There's something important in every scene. There's no padding in this show. Everything is important. And you pick up on things when you watch oh. it the second or third time um and i do i watch every episode three times at least so i just been, uh, I just been watching the previous episodes one to six uh, over the weekend yeah you've been doing marathons haven't you in the yep. lead up to each uh one so okay let's uh mm. let's go around uh sort of final thoughts and your uh rating out of 10 and uh chat if you'd give us your rating out of uh 10 in the chat that'd be great let us know what you think uh let's start with you blue Still a 9 out of 10 for me. Um, one small thing to what you're saying, Lance, you know, with uh, Anjin speaking out of turn, getting killed. Well, if Tornaga needs him, he wouldn't kill him right there. So I'm assuming. Well, no, that's true. But yeah. Yeah, everybody, like, is so shocked at his behavior. that that's, Oh, yeah. But that's, yeah. that's the thing. Anjin is so, like, pissed off at Tornaga. Like, I lost, like, I kind of, like, lost respect for you. And you're this, this, he calls, like, the master of trickery. And it's like, I thought you were so much better. And yeah, dude, it's like, I'm, because I'm not done yet. That's why. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, like you said, in like just a lot going on between just not just one character. Yeah, like some people would say, maybe Anjin or Black Dorn being kind of like not combat ready with the sword. But so far with the length of the show, he's just a sailor. He's there to learn the culture. In his mind, he probably doesn't have time to learn a whole new fighting style. I mean, come on, like the last samurai took the course of like what Tom Cruise was there for a couple of years. Black Dorn's only been here for what like four or five weeks or something like that. The guy's mm-hmm. not like he's not there to. No, I think by right. now he's been here longer. Okay. Know. Yeah. But I mean, um, he's mostly a like, prisoner of war. He's not there to be a samurai. Um, no, indeed. Um, but uh, uh, Darth, uh, give us your uh, what final thoughts and rating out of 10. But also, can you clarify f- sort of roughly how long he's supposed to have been there by now? Well, William Ammons landed there in April. I assume Blackthorn landed there about the same time. The Battle of Sigagahara took place in October. So that's six months. Oh, oh okay. Uh, All right. So, so, I don't, so we don't know. We don't really know. I think it's been more than a few weeks, though. Yeah, um, I'll, 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 I'll mention. Two, yeah, two I'll mention one. I'll mention one more thing before I get on to uh, what you asked. Is uh, hmm. a part that disappointed me is that uh, Yabu in the series doesn't really seem to be following the pattern of the uh, the original and the book. And that he he sort of grudgingly and gradually gains a respect for black thing. After watching this episode, I don't I don't see that at all. He has like complete and utter contempt for black. Yeah, that that's true. Um, I'd agree. Interesting. So, what what about your thoughts on the episode and uh, final rating out of ten? Okay. okay. Uh, the first time I watched the episode, I was really disappointed because, wait, they're really reimagining it. And I, and I thought, if we were going to have our review right then and there, I probably would have given it like an 8. But I thought about it. I, I spent a day and I thought about it and thought, well, this is a really difficult thing to adapt. And I don't want to compare it to the book or the original and just judge it on its own merit. They're probably trying to do something that's very tricky. So I watched the, I watched the episode again, bearing that in mind. And I'm going to give you a nine five. Okay. All right. Uh, Leroy. Well, I'm with Darth Plato. I had, I had to see this episode more. I saw this episode twice yesterday in order to give it a fair rating. And 
for starters, I'm giving it nine out of ten. But I just want to say how this show is so good that even the worst episodes, in which my in this case, I thought episode five was the worst one. I couldn't give it no less than eight point eight out of ten. I mean, that's how good I think the show is. So, um, big ups on the producers and the writers and the actors. And I'll say it once, I'll say it again. If this show does not get nominated for a Golden Globe or an enemy, I'm crying racism because this is is ridiculous. Yeah, it definitely should. Uh, it should be up for best show for starters. Yes, this it's it's ridiculous. The show is that good that even the worst episode you can't give no less than eight point eight out of ten. So, and and, I, and the reason why I say I'll be crying racism because because um what just happened at the Oscars with. Lily Gladstone getting passed up for best actress. If you've seen the Killers of the Flower Moon, and it's a, I've seen this pattern in Hollywood, which is supposed to be liberal. They'll, they'll let anyone who's considered a minority go so far before they take it all away from them. I hope they don't do this with this with this show, because all the actors, not not just um who the guy who plays Tornaga, but even the guy who plays Yabaguchi, Lily Mariko. Everyone is doing an A plus performance that there should be no excuse why this show should not be nominated for Emmy or Golden Globe. Hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I um, said the same about we did a show about five days at Memorial on Sunday. We've got one of the actors came on uh, that show with us and I, I said the same thing and it was only nominated for an Emmy. Oh, I think it might have won an Emmy for special effects. Um, I don't think it was nominated for any acting Emmys at all. And the acting in that show is just on another level to most shows. So I don't know why, um, you know, and it's, it's a, it's a mixed cast, but um, I don't know why uh, people weren't nominated, but Hey, hurricane Katrina controversial topic. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, Northern. Uh, the episode. It wasn't my favorite. I like the I don't like the Japanese characters, but I kind of hear um, how they made Blackthorn look a little bit weak. When come on, he should he should let Norta use a bloody cutlass because I mean he's a sailor, you know he's going to come by dangers and all that lot. So yeah, probably a seven out of ten for me. It's a weak Damn. episode, but that's a low yeah. blow. I know, but uh, still. It's still a better it's still a better episode than the best episode of She-Hulk. So yeah. I can't say Luke remember, <laughs> when he first holds a sword though, remember one thing, a cutlass is one handed weapon. He holds the samurai sword one handed, and then uh, Nabuchi yeah. there says no two hands. So he didn't he's, look yeah, very comfortable yeah. holding it with one hand either. He looks like he was That's having trouble saying. getting the sword out. He's like he's well, not. But the premise, yeah. remember, well, cut, well, in terms of weight, too, Cutlass is also, I mean, it weighs a lot less than a samurai sword. Remember, he's not used to holding a samurai sword just because you're, you know, used to, uh, so it's like guns. Not not every gun shoots the same. Exactly. I also, I, I feel like he would have, you know, got up one morning and played played around with it and done a bit of a kind of, you know, yeah. Stallone training sequence or something. Yeah, he should have learned that already. He should have learned it. Is that, you yeah. know, he's, uh, but, he could have had, he's had Taranaga yeah. on his side. Uh, Taranaga could have sent someone <laughs> to train for him. But fellas, like I said, this episode, this is probably the first episode which I actually started respecting Blackthorn more because towards the end, not only from learning, being allowed to train, being taught how to use a sword, but at the end when Tornaga surrendered, he called Yabashuki and Tornaga's son name. When he said it, he said it with respect because he agrees with them. To surrender would be cowardly. And he lost and he lost respect for Tornaga. The only guys he respected was Tornaga's son and Yaba Yabashigi. Well, we, I'm still trying to pronounce his name, but yeah, yeah, yeah we get a little bit. Yeah, the end, I'm, but, I'm uh, I, just, I want to Black see him Thor really. Yeah, yeah, it's just because I want to see him really get into the action a bit more in the next episode. And I hope mm. he does uh, start to learn how to fight with a sword a bit more and become a bit more competent battling this uh, enemy he's never come up against before. It's well, it's, we, almost, it's almost like a redo of the uh, the last samurai scene. That's but it seems like the only the, the scene only exists for that reason. Yeah, I was I was. Uh, what do you got? What do you got against the last samurai? I thought that was a good movie. 
Yeah, Last Samurai is a good movie, but it's we don't need to retread. It's not the same story, so I, I yeah. get what people are saying. It, it just feels like it, it borrowed, you know, somebody went, oh, yeah, we could put that in. Hey, Go Lance, ahead. I okay. Go ahead, Dark Play, though. Now, I had a question for Lance. Yeah. Um, actually, it's a question for anyone in the panel can answer. Um, so when does Naga decide to move against his uncle? Was it the scene when they were when he was in the springs with Omi and the uncle taught some while they're in the water? Or was it the scene where Fuji, where he and Fujiko are exchanging words? Or was it the scene where they were having the meeting and Blackthorn jumps up and he, although he did speak somewhat respectfully to Tormaga and, and I, th I think it was that scene. That was so that, do I. That's I think my, that's, that's, that's my take on it. Yeah, because in some ways, uh, Anjin kind of shamed them. Um, yeah. Uh, let's put aside that there are plans within plans and things going on. If if there weren't plans within plans, it it really is the act of a coward, and he kind of called him out for that. So, yeah. Plus, he's, um, he's leading his own men to get bloody killed as well, isn't he? Yeah, uh, yeah. So, well, yeah, he, he he and he says as much. He thinks everybody's just going to be marched off to their death, and he's already been told at least half his army will have to commit suicide. So, as is tradition, you know. So, um, yeah, he's, he's he just thinks it's a total waste of life, and I can't believe the guy's rolled over. Well, we all know that's not really what's happening, but from his perspective, that's what's also Lance. I have a theory on why Blackthorn, especially in this episode, isn't given much airtime because, like I said, this is from the Japanese point of view, not from the Richard, like, unlike the Richard Chamberlain Shogun, which was from the I mean, I'm, I mean, no offense from the yeah. white point of view. This one, I think they're trying to be careful, trying to avoid the whole white savior thing. They don't, which I re totally respect. They don't want to see that on this show. They want to, want to completely unromanticize and told from a Japanese point of view. Even, and I think that's why they're they're not giving Blackthorn, especially on this episode um as much airtime as let's say the previous episodes and let's and let's not forget from what happened from the first episode when we first see blackthorn he's he's a jerk <laughs> to put it mildly yeah i mean he hasn't massively improved uh, in that uh, uh, uh stakes uh, yeah I'm, uh, I'm also wondering about the absence of the jesuits we they're, they're really uh not showing a lot compared to the yeah I, I i have to admit i'm a bit disappointed because i like all their kind of scheming and stuff going on behind the scenes and we got quite a lot of them in the we did see the them in the last episode where they're considering joining tornaga one <laughs> scene four lines uh, that, that's Touché. all the jesuit in the original because he's got this smug pomposity to him you just want to punch this guy every time he shows up yeah that so actor like, always ooh. plays those parts as well yeah he does it so uh, well i love like it that face uh look <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, we could see a bit more with the priests. If there is any criticism, I would have liked, uh, you know, their kind of take on what they're hearing. And I guess that's what we got last episode. Maybe there isn't any more to be said, but um, that I think also they had really heavyweight actors playing those roles in the 80 version. So obviously they're going to use them whenever they can. Um, not so much here, but uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, my... My final rating on it's, um, I think, eight and a half out of ten. Um, good episode. Didn't like the uh, engine sword fight or lack of sword fight scene. Uh, but apart from that, that one. <laughs> that's just a personal, personal thing. I get why. Um, but I did feel it was a bit lifted from uh, Last Samurai. Not really sure we needed to see it. I would have preferred to seen a scene of him properly trying to train and then one of them coming along and yeah. laughing at his efforts and repeating the same thing he's doing, but like 20 times better, maybe. Well, that happened the last time, right, too. Yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I need to watch that, that, <laughs> that, that film again. Uh, clearly. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Um, oh, sure. We're here freelance, everybody. It's oh, like, this appears like, to be occurring. Sure, look at that. And just watch what he's holding it. So, and yeah. to be fair, to be fair, Yabu oh, is one of the no deadliest bullets in Japan. Yep. He's looking at he's like he can barely two hands. He can, yeah. Yeah. He was also holding it a bit like a um, you know, when they do fencing, um, 
that yeah. damn poise for like a fencing match. So, uh, yeah, but you know, um, Vince and Vega pointing out they don't really understand what the barbarians yapping about. <laughs> for they know he was asking for the loot, quite possibly. Yeah, <laughs> with all that, all that fish. Fab. Okay. Well, great. Uh, listen, but at the end of the day, criticisms aside, another fantastic episode of the show. Still a great yeah. show. Criticisms a few. Uh, so we're, yeah. we're fairly united on this. Um, so yeah, uh, great stuff. Uh, just to let people know a little bit off uh, topic. Um, actually, I'll go on camera briefly. Uh, Maya. My uh, copy of my first play arrived. There it is. Nice. So this is the proof version. And um, I've got to read through that as soon as I get off this stream because I'm trying to get it published for the Hillsborough anniversary. So that's the 15th. So that'll be like my 11th book uh, out on Amazon. Congratulations. Um, yeah, man. Worked my ass off this week to try and get that done in time. So, um, but yeah, I'm going to get some writing done yesterday. We'll try to get some writing done tomorrow. Tons of tons of typos to uh sort out. Okay, let's go around the panel. Just mention anything uh you've got coming up or whatever. Leroy, you can go first today. Well, like I said, I got some writing done yesterday. I'm going to try to get some writing done tomorrow and the rest of this week. I'm still trying to finish my new book before summer, but check out the rest of my books on Amazon. And other than that, not much. Okay. Uh, remind me of the name of your last book again. Uh, Face of it's called The Frontier, Book One, Face of the Sun. <clears throat> okay, I'll I'll pop it in the uh, chat in a second. Face of the Sun. Uh, Blue, what you got coming up? Um, about twenty minutes. We take my kid to go see the twenty fifth anniversary of the Matrix. Oh, really? Oh, I mean, yeah. I, I can't. I still remember when I, I still remember that movie came out. I went to. Yeah. I, I first saw it in the theaters and I was mesmerized. Yeah, and that's what I'm like. And my kid, of course, you know, he's seen it on DVD since then. But just we all know, just going to the theater and seeing the Matrix in the theater is a different experience. So, and of course, you only have one showing. So I'm like, yeah, check out one showing. And I did tell Lance yesterday, but I'll catch it tomorrow. They only have one showing again. But uh, late night with the devil is getting good. Um, good word of mouth. Yeah. They only show one showing a day, so I'll catch it tomorrow. Yeah, Late Night with the Devil is getting amazing reviews. Yeah. Everybody's talking about it, like the film to see. I'm hoping so it gets more word of mouth. We'll probably be talking about that on the Nielsen ratings uh, next week. Yeah, I have um, a question. What was the what was the first movie you saw in theater? Uh, the first one I can remember seeing, uh, and I'm not sure of the order, was either Bambi on re-release or Oliver Twist, the musical on re-release. The first movie... I, I can't believe I actually remember this. The first movie I ever saw in theater was The Mighty Quinn, starring Denzel Washington oh. and Robert Townsend. Oh. That was the first movie I saw in theater. First movie I thought in theater was the Star Trek motion picture. Whoa. Whoa. I, saw, I saw that in the cinema. We were, we were all so bored. We were like expecting pew pew and Star Wars. And it was like, damn, this film's slow. <laughs> and um, how many sequels did they make? <laughs> God. Well, I mean, yeah, but the Wrath of Khan was a completely different film, you know. I remember um, the first Ninja Turtles at the time, man, the, the Jim Henson makeup and Ninja Turtles was so fantastic for an eight year old. Like, that's still fantastic now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, indeed. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Blue, anything else you got coming up? Uh, no, just playing more Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I told people I clocked in as this morning, Lance, 81 hours in that game. I'm still playing it. So, it's... Uh, Darth, what else you got coming up? Oh, I don't know. I thought I'd go for a walk, maybe get something to eat, maybe take a shower later. Um, <laughs> Streaming oh, wise, week? or things you want to plug? <laughs> I'm going to plug Lance's channel, and I'll come back next week. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Northern, then last, but by no means least. Uh, tomorrow, eleven o'clock, I'll be uh, doing a view to a kill with Barbara Lawrence. We're going to be discussing that film. Uh, I've done the slides. Probably want to look for a few little shots to add on for the footage, you know, like little trivia where videos, if I can find any. And uh, that's it so far. I don't know what I'm going to do next week. No idea yet. Yeah, that's but a good night of You know that uh, Grace Jones and uh, Roger Moore hated each other. Yep. Really? Got, uh, on that, I've got a clip up for that ready on the stream. Why did they hate like, each other? They didn't get on. And one time um, when they'd had a massive row, she came 
running back into I can't, it was either his dressing room or on, on set with a massive sex toy and um chased him around the room with it and and that apparently did like break the tension and they both cracked up laughing so um, grace jones strikes me as the kind of woman whose bad side you don't want to get on well yeah, yeah what's, thrown in the story she slapped uh there's my last book someone was asking about it that's my uh that's my last book uh there you go uh yeah okay i also um said i would uh plug a friend of mine's book uh my friend adele has got a fantasy book out called darkness dreaming it's doing pretty well um i'm gonna get her on the channel to come and talk about it 44 reviews uh 43 of them five out of five one of them four out of five so pretty good stuff um not sure if that was dolph's first role um i think view to a kill did that come before no 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 rocky four was out before that yeah, yeah Rock, Rock, i was gonna Rock say Rocky before Rock was that out, out before view to a kill wasn't it yeah yeah view to a kill was 85 86 i thought it was like 86 87 yeah yeah might have been yeah no living daylights was 87 wasn't it because uh then 89 living was daylights was 87 that's right it was yeah. 87 yeah i think uh view to a kill was 85 but rocky four was out before you way know. before then huh. yeah he just got that role because he was seeing um he was dating grace jones at the time yeah and uh they said oh well you, you know you might as well have this role um so yes yes he was the better guard yes yeah that's right all right guys we're gonna wrap it up there so uh thanks to everyone in the chat for uh hey, Lance. Lance, sorry, before we go, um, can I recommend a book for you guys to read? Yeah, go for I've, it. This, this book um, is a Western that what inspired me to become a writer myself. It's called Grizzly Killer. It's the first book in 19... In, there are 19 books in the series. Wow. This is the first book. It's called The Making of the Mountain Man. Lena Rowensky, who's a great guy, um, you can find on Amazon. I've read this book at least over 10 times. It's yeah. that good. And it's the first okay. the 19th book is coming out in May. And I highly recommend that, that series. It's called the Grizzly Killer series by Lana. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a, a lot of Grizzly Killer books. So I think I saw the first uh book of that adapted into a movie. I think it's called Cocaine Bear. So uh, that's uh, a funny movie. Uh, but, on that <laughs> note, on that note, uh that just remains to say thanks to my guests, uh, Blue Collar Loser, Darth Plato, Leroy Peters, Northern English Starred. Do please uh, check out their links for their channels and work and books and all the rest of it. Uh, Z, Z Actual has just arrived in time for us to go. Um, but thanks very much for coming in. Do check out the other content on the channel. I will be back again on Tuesday. I think my next planned stream, I think, is Tuesday, the Nielsen ratings. I don't think I've got anything on this weekend, uh, but that may change. You never I'm know. I'm looking forward to next Wednesday. So, uh, and next Wednesday, we'll be back again talking about uh, Shogun Episode 8. Only three more to go. Yeah, only three Until more, then, yeah. Take care. Uh, don't forget to call the people that you care about, tell them you love them, and we'll see you all again real soon. Right. Good night. Yeah.